Once I was lost, I was lost down deep in sin. Down deep in sin. But Christ my Lord, but Christ my Lord, he took me in, he took me in. My soul was on, my soul was on destruction.
with arms around me, like within me, gently lays me out of darkness to the shelter of the There's a city 
that just thrills my heart, that just lifts me up because it kind of gives me another promise of what's waiting for me just right out there. Amen. Uh, you know, children, we have to serve him. The Bible tells us that God has set both life and death before us, and it's up to us to choose whether we take the life, and I'm not talking about, per se, this natural life, I'm talking about the spiritual life. And death is not talking about the death we see about every day here in this walk of life, but it's the death that's facing the people that haven't accepted God on the terms of his gospel. Yes. Because, you know, I've looked back over scriptures and the Bible and how that, you know, we, we look at our lives and we think that we've got it so very hard. But then if we go in the Old Testament and start looking about how those people lived back there and how what their requirements was, then it puts a whole different realm on our life, our natural life, I'll say. Because back then, uh, if a man and a woman was caught in committing adultery or fornication, they were taken outside the city and stoned to death. What, if, what would it be like in today's world that uh, it was still like that? And I've thought so much about how that, that Joseph, he was an espoused husband to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and how that he thought about putting her away because back then, because she was pregnant, and everything, they would have taken her outside the city and would have stoned her to death. And Joseph would have been the man to throw the first stone at her. Now you think about this. But yet God revealed to him that she was innocent, that she had never known another man. And you know, there's a lot to that story. But you know, children, why did it happen that way? Now my theory is that Adam, whenever he was uh, created here on earth and how that he laid there, God formed him out of, the, out of the dust of the earth and there he laid a lifeless lump of clay and God breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and he became a living soul. And you know, he had one commandment to do. For God, to not to eat of the forbidden fruit. And you know, he ended up eating from that forbidden fruit, and that's what brought death upon the whole human family. And you know, they say that the bloodline usually comes from the Father. And I believe that that had a whole lot to play in the part that a natural man here on earth would not have been the father of Jesus because God wanted him pure and undefiled yes. because regardless how it is here in this walk of life we have sin in our lives and Jesus knew no sin Amen. Jesus from, from the time that he was born <laughs> and according to the to the old law by a child that was born like as a lot of people would look at Jesus as being born not the son of, of God but just the son of some man he, he was not allowed to ever go in to the holies of holies into where the priest was and everything but when he was eight days old they took him there to be circumcised according to the law. He, he, was, he was in where he wasn't supposed to have been when he was eight days old, but he kept it going there all down through his life. Think about this. And you know, if you was born like illegal, or not, I don't know hardly how to put it, but anyway, born with the natural father back then that was corrupt and everything, they were not allowed to go into the temple 
even up until I think it's 10 generations. So it was really strict back under the law. But you know it's not like that anymore, children. We need to truly believe in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because he was the one that paid that great sin debt. He lived about 33 and a half years. And he, wicked people, wicked people, falsely accused him. They lied on him. They falsely accused him and tuck him and hung him on the old tree of the cross for our sins. I've done terrible things in my life. It's hard for me to understand why that he loved me so much, but I'm so glad and thankful that he did. I'm so glad and thankful that I was looking at myself as I was walking around blind in this old world. Yes, I could see with these eyes naturally, but spiritually I couldn't see. I was walking around blind. And God opened up that little twig of light. And I started searching after that light. And I'm so glad and thankful that he did because of the love that God had for us. The love that Jesus had willing to go and be crucified the way he was. I believe that he was beaten, scourged, mocked, made all manner of fun of. And I don't, I don't think there's ever or ever be another human being on this earth that could have gone, went through what Jesus did there before he went to that old tree of the cross. Because that was how he was supposed to die. That was fulfilling the plan of God. And I think God allows things like that to happen to open up the blinded eyes of, of the people that's walking around in sin. And you know, children, whenever I started seeking after God and begging Him to come into my heart, you know, whenever I laid it all down at His feet, He was willing to accept me yes. into His kingdom, Amen. into His righteousness. Does that mean that I could just go out and back out in the world and do anything and everything that I'd already done? No. I was buried with him in water baptism. I was raised to walk in a newness, a newness of life. And he said to set my affections on things which be above, not the things of this old world, because it's all going to burn up one day. I am so thankful that God allowed me the knowledge and the wisdom that he's given me. No, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but I'm smart enough to know that I am to follow him, to do the very best that I can. Am I going to sin? Yes. The Bible tells us that we sin daily and come short of the glory of the Father. So we need to consider that. We need to look at that. Because, you know, children, I pray just about all the time for him to give me the knowledge and the wisdom to understand his word. Amen. That I would rightly divide it as I go through this life. And you know, children, to me, that means it all to me. Because I know that he's always with me. He's always leading me around. You know, children, we can get a hold of something and start leading, leading it around. And first thing you know, we'll turn loose of it. But I don't think God will ever turn loose of our hands, children, as long as we're faithful to Him. You're right. Because He loves us that much. Yes, He does. He wants us to be bright and shining light for Him. Not that it give me glory or Brother Tony or anybody else, right. but that it give Him the glory. Yeah. And that's what, children, I want to do as I go through this life. I want to be glory unto the Father. Because you know, children, he brings joy, peace, love, and happiness yes. to this old boy. And I want to go to heaven when this life's over with. Yes. Praise the Lord. Not because mommy is there or daddy or anybody else. I want to go there because of Jesus, what he's done for me. Amen. And to be able to shun that terrible place is called hell. Because, you know, children, I've read word that, that in the day of judgment that there's going to be people that jump up in front of Christ and say, oh, well, didn't I do this and didn't I do that and didn't I do so and so? And what is he going to say? Depart from me, 
you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. So we need to be careful to get in this good way, and we need to be careful how we walk and how we act, how we talk and everything. Because children, people is a watching us. Yes. They're watching every move we make. I'm reminded so many times of myself back before I got in the church. You know, I didn't look at the regular Christians. I looked at the preachers. And if they'd say one word that I thought was wrong, I didn't even want to hear them preach or anything. That was the old devil working children, and that's the way he's still working today. He's pointing out things. Sure, we make we make mistakes as we go through this world. But you know, children, God will forgive us if we've got that pure and undefiled heart in our lives. Right. But you know, children, if we're evil, I don't think He'll forgive us because He's a loving God. And I'm looking for that time that I'll leave this old world and depart this walk of life. Because you know, children, all I see in this world now is corruption. It seems like it's corruption on every hand. It's evil. I believe this world, whenever it was set up, that it was set up perfect. Yes, it was. But mankind has corrupted it. The Bible tells us that people will come to the point of where they'll say a lie is the truth and the truth is a lie. Right. Don't we see that on every hand today? Amen. We see that on every hand. So let us follow Jesus. Let us don't follow man here in this walk of life. Because you know, children, I believe that it's uh, my duty to work God the if whenever somebody preaches something other for me to study and see if they're telling me the truth or not. Sometimes I can't figure it out. But you know, again, I ask God to give me the knowledge and the wisdom to understand it. That's right. And sometimes he will show me and sometimes he won't. And maybe it just wasn't meant for me to know it because probably if I knew everything that I'd ever asked him to, to give me the knowledge of, I'd probably be one of the smartest people in the world. But it's not like that. We're just what we are to God. We can't be no different. But I want to be a loving child of God. I want to live a life that the sinner people in this world might see the joy and happiness that I have in my heart and in my life. Because you know, children, that's what I want to do when this life's over. Amen. If it's okay, I'm going to try to sing a song that I was up to midnight last night looking at this song. And it's one of them songs that I look at the words of the song and it really lifts me up. Now, I'm not going to sing it perfect, but you know, children, I want you to listen to the words of the song because. The, the words in this song really lifts me up. What a time in heaven is the name of the song. Some morning when the Lord shall call me, I want to be ready to go up yonder to the beautiful heaven, that sea that white as snow, where the flowers are blooming forever, and the sun there never goes down. You talk about a time in heaven when I put on my robe and crown. What a time in heaven when I lay these burdens down. What a time in heaven when I put on my robe and crown. Everyone shouting glory hallelujah when I leave this sinful ground. What a time in heaven when I put on my robe and crown. You talk about a time in the morning when the good Lord calls us home. We'll leave this land of sorrow, never more on earth to roam. 
we'll be moving, moving yonder to the city in the sky where the saints will live forever. There will never more die. What a time in heaven when I lay these burdens down. What a time in heaven when I put on a robe and crown. Forever shouting glory, hallelujah, when I leave this sinful ground. What a time in heaven when I put on a robe and crown. What a time in heaven when I put on my robe and crown. Amen. Brother Tom. What a time it will be. Yes. We're thankful for what we've already been a part of here this morning. Good to see all of you. Thankful for everybody. Good crowd today. The Lord's blessed us with a beautiful day out there. He's already blessed us with a good service here this morning. And get ready to go to prayer if you got an unspoken request. I hope you list. If you have anybody you want to mention, we'll give you an opportunity. Remember my mother, she's been sick and my roommate. And also, continue to remember our great granddaughter that some of our Tony, always remember me and mine, and let's remember <coughs> Sister Sally. She told me yesterday that she was going to go to the ER tomorrow if she's not no better. She said they wouldn't used to go over the weekend, they wouldn't do nothing. She's just as sore, she can hardly get up and down, she's on a walker. I don't know if she's broke anything or what. Go remember her, Brother Curtis. Remember your Uncle Val. I talked to Bernice this morning. She said he's doing a little bit. Brother Jackie this morning, he said, continue to remember him. Sister Darlene is slowly getting worse with her dementia. So keep them in your prayers. I know it's a strain, a burden on them and family, so let's remember them too. It's tough taking care of those folks when they get in that condition. Uh, we'll get Brother Roger. I haven't heard from him this week. He's, well, he, he, he sent me a message this morning and said that wasn't going to be able to come. Sister Polly Sansom, they've moved her in Wayne now to nursing home. So if any of you all are in that way, stop and see Sister Polly. I know she'd be glad to see some of Salem. It's been a while since she's been able to be here. And uh, they mentioned, I think it was Friday night, Sister Judy's dad had a bad fall. So don't forget him. Also, Sister Judy, don't forget her. She's, uh, she's having some health problems. We're trying to figure out what her issue is. So keep her in your prayers, too. I talked to her yesterday, but she just she just can't get out what she wants to say. She said she did tell me they was doing treatment, and uh, what's name <coughs> that they were doing some kind of speech stuff. On her. But you know, what kind of something happened. The doctor said that it's not, you know. But she is fit. She really is fit. Everybody is. First time remember me. Glad 
to see you, Sister Connie, here this morning. Brother Tony, remember me. Brother Ronnie, good to see you too. Anybody else? Always remember me and my family. And I'd like to thank the Lord for watching over an old friend of mine. He went to the brain surgery. Came through good. He was still sick, and I, you know, as far as seeing sick. He's a good friend, and I ask you all to pray for you. Anybody else? Remember my family. Time of year, there's a lot of churches. Here's done them. Our stepholders go to churches, done them. They're doing Christmas programs. Let's pray that. I mean, a lot of our kids get to go to church often. or take them to church, but there's probably a lot of kids that might be involved in these but don't go to church. Let's pray that they might remember something or learn something that'll stick with them when they get old enough. Yeah. <coughs> shelter. Also, it's it starting getting colder this time of year. There's a lot of people that's alone. Let's pray up a little prayer for them. All right. Pray for this service this morning. Pray for each other. We, we need to lift each other up. Let's be thankful. Give him glory for what he's done for us. And, uh, let's just talk to him. Make no rhyme or reason. Go through a routine. I know we get our little prayer lists out and we go through this, bless this, bless that. God's not in that. Now I lay me down to sleep stuff. He, he, he wants us to get serious and talk to him. And he even tells us, don't pray in repetition. So let's talk to him while we bow down here. Everyone, this is for everybody. Not just the one we call on the lead prayer, but we can all take advantage right now and just talk to him from the heart. So let's let's do that. Everybody will bow down. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. Tony, uh, there was a young man that brought a neck with his car that line the other day in Kim. So let us remember that time. Let's work back.
what you've done in the past. We thank you for all the blessings that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for our children. We thank you, Lord. May be with them as they go out of this life, Lord. You may keep a hedge about them. Keep them safe. The precious spirit that God on down to give us all children, Lord. Encourage you. May you put good people in their path, Lord. It'll be a help to bless our minds. Let them make good decisions. We don't have to give a blessing again, Lord. Thank you for our spouse. Thank you for our health family. Thank you for our friends and family. We know what they have to want. This little church is going to be the greatest blessing to get over there. Lord, we're all ready for the calling of the call to be the saving stations. Be able to love on you throughout eternity. May you bless the brother. We know what you want. That you may bring to his remembrance, Lord, what he's done. May you just use him as a vessel, Lord, to spread your good cause and understand the Lord about you. We know you have a big, big plan to put in place. We know that we have a big hand that can reach down, Lord, Lord, it gives us a whole amount of sin. And we'll Encourage us to hold us to know how much you do. Bless the singers that may come before us, Lord. And may you just be with this little service that you may spread the Spirit from breast to breast, Lord. And we praise you today, Lord. Thank you for giving us your Son on the cross for the atonement of our sins, Lord, and paying a debt that none of us can pay. And when we face you in that great judgment day, Heavenly Father, may you accept us into heaven. All these favors and blessings we ask in Jesus' name, and amen. amen.
chapter this morning. I want to start here. and uh, There's a whole lot in this book. We've been reading and studying this for a, actually a couple of weeks now. There's a lot in here and looking at the history that's taken place, uh, situation that was there, and trying to apply it to ourselves today and what the Lord wants out of us. Um, it would be more than what we can even give it justice this morning and the time we've got left in this service. And I hope that you'll follow along and take time, if you've never read this book, to take some time to sit down and read it. And you may say, well, I, I'm confused. I don't know what it's talking about. Well, we may have to dig a little deeper and try to understand a little more. And if we do, we'll get a blessing out of it. I hope you all have taken time this week to read something. If you haven't, shame on you. That's what the Lord wants you to do. I also hope you took time this week to intentionally just set aside and pray. If you haven't done that, shame on you. Because God wants to talk to you. As I've said very often, you moms and dads, if you've never heard from your kids, it'd probably bother you. It hurts you. Don't you think God loves to hear from us? And don't you think it's good talk to him when you don't just want something. If the only time you heard from your kids and grandkids is when they call wanting something, I know some people like that. That's the only time I hear from them is when they want something. And I know you probably know something like that too. So let's not just be that child that just calls when, he, when we're needing something or want something. And that's a lot of times what we're doing in our prayers. Let's just sit down. Sometimes you may not have to say a word. Just sit there and listen. Say, well, he don't speak to us. Yeah, he does. He can make things come into your mind. He can bring scriptures. This is what he chose to speak to us, is the word. But that spirit can also begin to revelate our mind about things and people, situations that he wants us to do in our life. And we need to stay in tune with that as we live here. 
If we do, we'll not lead into the problem that this group of people that Amos was about to prophesy to was in. They were in bad shape. And God was about to bring judgment upon them. And he sent Amos, a country preacher. He wasn't well educated. We read sometimes about some of these prophets that did you ever hear of the sons of the prophets? You know the time that the old man of God went down there and he lost his axe head? That boy lost his axe head. What were they doing? They were building a place because where the sons of the prophets were, those young prophets learning from the older prophets, you might call it a school if you will. They were sitting there trying to gain more knowledge. Well, this fellow Amos, he wasn't one of those folks that sat under all the older prophets. He said that he was just a shepherd little country boy on the outskirts of town there that lived near the wilderness. It was a very rural area. He was a tender of sheep. He gathered sycamore fruit, which is a, a very vague type of figs that they ate of. Only poor people ate them. So he was a poor man. God used him for a task. And don't you all ever think, just because we're here from Wayne County or in the head of some of these hollers, that God can't use us. He can definitely use every one of us. Your sisters too. He can use you all. And I'm thankful that he's able to do that. So he sent these folks down there. And I want to start here kind of in the middle. And then we'll back up and get what was leading up to it. And then we'll try to go a little further as we go through here. And I know I'll not give this justice. So I'll just right now tell you ahead of time. Take some time after today to go read this. Don't sit there and read it while I'm preaching to you. Because you'll not listen to me. But take some time and read what this book says. Fifth chapter in the first verse. The first word that he says here is, Hear ye this word. Listen real close. Yeah. And that's what we ought to do today is listen to what the Lord wants us to say. Take heed and begin to listen to the voice of the Lord. Because as we said a while ago, he's chose through the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. He's also chose that preaching to allow our faith to be strengthened and to add to our faith. So we got into the church by hearing the word and obtain the faith to be able to become a Christian. And if we'll continually listen to the word as we grow and mature as a Christian, then we'll be able to add more to our faith and be a stronger Christian and be able to eat some of the meat of the word. Hear ye, he's telling this people, hear ye this word, which I take up against you, even a lamentation, O house of Israel. Lamentation is weeping, crying, Moaning out to God. There's a book of lamentations here. We find the old prophet Jeremiah was referred to as the weeping prophet. Because he had a burden. This man here had a burden in his heart. He was weeping and mourning and crying out to God. For this group of people in Israel that he loved. That God had sent him to begin to mourn. Then he goes on and he starts using some Bible language. That was very common back there with these folks. The virgin of Israel is fallen. If they're fallen, sounds like they're in bad shape, doesn't it? Yeah. If we're fallen, we better watch out. We're in bad shape too. Yeah. She shall no more rise. She is forsaken upon her land. There is none to raise her up. For thus saith the Lord God, the city that went out by a thousand shall leave a hundred, and that which went forth by a hundred shall leave ten to the house of Israel. Not much left for it. There's not much hope left for Israel here because of what they've done. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel. He's talking to his chosen people here, the people that he loves. And who's that house of Israel today? That's me and you. So let's apply this and look at it in a spiritual sense as well today. Because if we start going the wrong direction in our life and we're not getting close to God, we're in just the baddest shape as these people are right here. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. Seek ye me. We sung a song a while ago. Brother Bruce made a comment in the choir about, I'm so glad that he found me. I'm glad that he knew right where I was all along. But there came a point, even though that he knew right where I was all along, there came a point in my life. I had sat under gospel preaching. I was raised in the church. Had a papa that preached and pastored and was a, was a good godly man and a great Christian family that I was a part of with him and my mom. But there came a point, a time in my life that I sat in a service just like this and God directed a message right at me in my heart when I was unsaved. 
And he done the same for all of you. Yeah. There came a point that when that gospel, we may have heard it over and over and over again, but at some point, he begins to make it a little more strong in our mind, a little more powerful as it speaks to our soul, had a little more drawing power. And he's promised that at least one time he would do that to every individual. And I'm thankful that he done it to me more than once and allowed me to come in. So I'm glad that he done that. But in order for him to come to me and speak to me in that manner, the Word of God came to me, just like Amos is coming to this group of people there. I was unsaved. There's been times in my life as a Christian that I wasn't living where that I should have and I may have been getting cold or I may have done something that I shouldn't have that I had to start seeking the Lord's forgiveness and His mercy, His blood to blot out the spots of sin that may have been in my life. You know, we had to come to Him and seek Him because we know what the Scripture says. Ask and you shall find. Seek or ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. A-S-K, ask. Ask, seek, find. He'll be able to be there for us when we do that. But that's not just to the unsaved. That's for us that are Christians too here this morning. So he's telling this group of Israel, the house of Israel, to seek me and ye shall live. If we'll seek after him, the Bible teaches us happily. If you'll feel after him, you'll find it. And I'm glad today that that still holds true to us. But seek not Bethel. Nor enter into Gilgal, and pass not to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to naught. Nothing. If we don't seek the Lord, we're going to come to nothing in our life. You've heard me preach on being less than nothing, as David said many times. And if we consider ourselves less than nothing, we need somebody to pay the debt that we owe. And Jesus Christ's blood is the only thing that could have taken care of that. Amen. He says it again, verse 6, Seek the Lord. And ye shall live. Seek Him, and ye shall live. Church, seek Him, and ye shall live. If you're not growing, if you're not getting anything out of a service, let's not altogether blame the preacher all the time. I hear that a lot. But let's begin to look in the mirror sometimes because God, if we're reading this book the way that we ought to and we're praying the manner that we ought to, then no matter what message is being spoken, that we can get something out of just one kind of word or one word of Jesus Christ can begin to trigger something in our mind to cause us to begin to meditate upon that. Now, I'm not saying this to say, brother, you don't need to study yourselves because the Bible tells us that stand where I'm at right now, that we're to study to show ourselves approved a workman unto God that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth that we're able to get in this book and begin to lean upon Jesus that He'd give us direction that we could go that we might do as He told Peter there that day. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, thou knowest. Feed my lambs. And then he asked him again the third time. Feed my sheep. So we've got to be able to do this. As the wise man of God said to a young brother one time. If you're able to put the brethren in remembrance of these things. And advise those that are not living where that they should. Then you'll altogether not just save them. But you'll save yourself. And those that will hear you. So we've got a big responsibility on what we say when we stand right here. And we're not just saying the same warmed over sermon that we preached last Sunday. God wants us to be good workmen as we're coming to the Lord. So seek the Lord and ye shall live. Lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it. And there be none to quench it in Bethel. Ye who turn judgment to wormwood. That's bitterness. And leave off righteousness in the earth. Seek him. Seek him. That maketh the seven stars. And Orion turneth the shadow of death into the morning. And maketh the day dark with night. That calleth for the waters of the sea. And poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. That strengtheneth the spool against the strong. So that the spool shall come against the fortress. They hate him that rebuketh in the gate. And they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. For as much, therefore, as your treading is upon the poor, and ye take from him burdens of wheat, ye have built houses of hewn stone, but ye shall not dwell in them. Ye have planted pleasant vineyards, but ye shall not drink wine of them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just, they take a bribe, 
And they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. Therefore, the prudent shall keep silent in that time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and evil, seek good and not evil, that ye may live. So the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as I have spoken. Hate evil and the love of good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Now, as he started speaking here, we need to understand to get what he's talking about there. And there's a lot of Bible language in this. And what I'm saying when I talk about Bible language is some of the things that you may read in the book of Revelation about moons and stars and all these things that he speaks of. That's all talking about judgment that's coming down upon the earth and upon a people. When he begins to speak about a day of the Lord, there's been many days of the Lord and judgments that's been cast down upon people here on this earth because of the way that they were living. So in order to understand fully what he's talking about here in chapter 5 when he begins to prophesy against this group of people, we've got to back up and see what that he was looking at and what the occasion was in this book of Amos. If you'll look back there in chapter 1, you're going to find that he spoke to this man, a man by the name of Amos. We've already told you who he was and where that he came from at the 5th chapter and on over in the 8th. He tells us that he was just a shepherd boy, that he was a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And when we look at his life, this poor boy that came up that God used to be able to speak against the children of Israel, and not just those children of Israel, but as he looks at the sins of everybody that's around him, he begins to let them know, and we find that he was living in a place of Tekoa that was a place that was in the land of Judah. Now, for you to understand what that means and why that is something that we should even mention here this morning, we need to understand the situation that was going on there at that time. For we look at this place, the time of Amos, we're going to find that Israel as a whole, as the whole ten tribes, the twelve tribes of Israel, you all have heard about the twelve tribes of Israel, those twelve boys of Jacob that he had, whose name was changed to Israel. He had twelve sons. And all those 12 sons were given an allotment of land there in the promised land. And when he divided all that out, remember the Levites, and I'm trying not to go into too much detail of this so that we can get to the message that we need to here this morning. But help me just lay down a little bit of a groundwork to get up where we need to be. And if you'll follow along with me and get with where I'm going, then you might be able to get some help here this morning too. So he had blessed this great nation of Israel, divided out all the land. They multiplied and they grew and they had children, grandchildren, multiplied me of people in this great family of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it came to the point that this king that they had, uh, by the name of Solomon, that he set out a tax set upon all the people. And he started taxing. And when you start getting in people's wallet, what happens? We see it today. When we get our taxes raised, we'll complain about it, we'll grab about it, because it's starting to get into our billfold and what that we make. Uh, we don't like to pay any extra to the government than we, what we need to and what we should. So at this time, he started giving them a tax to be able to take care of the things. But when he began to fall off the scene and die, his son began to step into the scene by the name of Jeroboam. And Jeroboam did ease up on the taxes that these folks were given. He actually made it worse and they had more of a burden upon them. And because of that, we find that the children of Israel, just like this nation in the United States did many, many years ago, in the 1800s we had a civil war and we were split right down the middle with the north and with the south. That's what happened with the children of Israel. Some of them wanted to stay with Jeroboam and there was another sect of them that we'll call Judah that became the nation of Judah and they wanted to go with another individual by the name of Rehoboam and it'll get confusing because you see both their names even sound alike one way or different. Rehoboam was with Judah and Jeroboam was the king that was over Israel. And so Jeroboam was the one that had the taxes that began to go out and certain ones of the children of Israel followed after him. And then another sect of the Jews began to follow after Rehoboam. So they were split down the middle and they became two nations and Israel was separate there for a certain time. Now when these nations were separated and 
when they were divided at the time that Amos was living, Amos was living in that southern kingdom of Israel called Judah. And he was living there in the land. And he began to see what was going on to the north of him in the kingdom of Israel. Now, why would he be going up there? Probably because of his sheep. They had to go up there and sell some sheep. They had been gathering that sycamore fruit, those figs, and had to go up there and sell some. I don't know. Well, altogether, the scripture's not playing on why that he was aware of what was going on up there. And he may have not been altogether aware of what was going on. It may have just been that God revealed to his mind uh, the sins of the people of Israel. Uh, Israel being that northern kingdom. And uh, now when those two were separated, uh, God calls a man out of Judah, the southern kingdom, uh, who were walking with him. Now remember, uh, there was a place and these brother, brother Bruce just began to talk about about Jerusalem and the importance of that temple up there. Uh, so you would think that Israel would value that temple because that's where God told people to go to worship at that time. Uh, that's where they had to go make the sacrifices. Uh, but that was not so because the capital city of Jerusalem was located in the kingdom of Judah in the southern kingdom. Uh, so what do you think about those people in the north? They've been separated now. Uh, they've had a civil war. Uh, they've got a boundary between them. Uh, so what did King Jeroboam do uh, about Jerusalem and the law that said you've got to go there to, for Passover? You've got to go there for all these festivals and feasts to be able to celebrate and worship God? Uh, he said that's okay. You don't have to go down to the temple. You don't have to go down to Jerusalem. Uh, now right there is when we get in trouble, when we start telling people our own ideas and what we think uh, is right that goes contrary to the word of God. Uh, King Jeroboam had not one right or authority uh, to tell the people in the northern kingdom uh, that they couldn't go to Jerusalem where God dwelt, uh, where they were supposed to have all the sacrifices and the blood applied at. Now uh, you see today, uh, because of their disobedience up there, uh, tell them they didn't have to do what God said, uh, that they could make shift and do it their way uh, and offer up the sacrifices in a makeshift place. Hey, uh, but today my friends, that won't do. And we'll say, well, that was just to them. That was how that they lived. And they had to do that. It's the same today with God's people. People will say today, I don't have to go to church and be faithful there. I don't have to be baptized. I don't have to be a member of a church. My friend, the Scripture makes it very clear that we need to be together, that we need to gather like we are, that we need to sit under the leadership of a local church, uh, that we need uh, to be able to be taught and to be uh, disciplined if we need to be, uh, that we need to be with each other uh, so that we can gain strength to fight the fight that's out there in this world. Uh, and if we begin to allow the things of this life uh, to flood in our mind with the secular music uh, and the secular TV shows uh, and everything that's around us that's gotten so uh, corrupt up and when we have all this garbage it may appear that there's nothing sinful about it but if it hinders us from doing what God wants us to do there will be somebody come along and pat you on the back say it's okay go spend time with your family I miss church this day and you know what the next time that that comes about that you put something in front of attending church or doing what God wants you to do the next time it will be a little Right. That's how the old devil tries to creep into our lives. He's not all the time some big sinful thing that begins to appear before us, but he's something that wants to hinder our walk. He is very crafty. And we don't have to deal with the situations the way that he spoke of the law dealt with them a while ago about how that we do this and how that it's all cut and dry. But today, Satan likes to work in our minds and begin to get us so busy and so occupied with things that are around us and our family and our job and that we don't take time out to serve God like we would. That's right. What should we do? What did he tell them to do? Seek the Lord. Yeah. Seek after him and you'll be able to find him. Yeah. So my old Amos began to come there and hit that. The king Jeroboam said, don't nobody go down to Jerusalem and worship anymore. So there they began to stray away from what God told them to do. So 
But God told Amos, He said, I want you to tell them. And He doesn't just try to line Israel out. And it wasn't Amos doing it. It was God through Amos that was advising them on what they should do. But as you look through chapter 1, you're going to find that Amos began to speak to all the neighboring countries that were around. And he even referred to an old prophet by the name of Joel in the second verse there. So apparently he'd been reading and listening to what the other old prophets had said. And as he began to advise these people on how that they ought to live and warn them of their lives all through chapter 1, he began to warn them there in Damascus. He warned them the Philistines and what they needed to do. He told them time and time again of all these places and these nations. And then in chapter 2, he came down and he even began to rebuke Judah and Israel for the life that they were living. So today, if we will begin to look to God and understand what that His plan is for us, He wants us all to draw nigh unto Him. I know we as preachers put that to our unsaved and then it'll preach its good doctrine and tell the lost to draw nigh to Him. But today when He said that in the New Testament, He was telling us, the church, draw nigh unto God. Amen. He'll draw nigh unto you. He began to speak in chapter 2 to that northern kingdom of Israel about how good it used to be with them when they were walking the way that they should have. He began to speak down through there and how that He allowed them to overcome the Amorites in chapter 2 and verse 9, he let them destroy those Amorites before whose height was like the height of the cedars. They were giants in the land. But he blessed them to overtake them. Why? And because they were living obedient unto him. And don't you think today, we may not face any literal Goliaths in our life as a Christian. We may not face a literal giant and that's as tall as a cedar tree. But my friends, today there will be enemies that come our way and there will be obstacles that come our way and that you may have already been able to overcome in your life. And there's been many that I've been blessed to overcome and because of me, but because of the one that was helping me just like David. I went to that giant through that day and he said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. Another writer reminds us it's not by power nor by might, but by thy spirit, saith the Lord. If me and you today in the church of the living God are going to be victorious and then we've got to come the way God wants us to come and that's in His name and that He would get glory not that we would get any honor but that God would get all the attention. They battle all of these. He continues all through chapter 2 the blessings of the past. Let's be careful not to live in the past. I'm thankful for the times God's moved in my life. I'm thankful for the many services that the Holy Spirit's been in and worked with. But we can't live all together in that all the time. And us as the old United Baptists, we're bad for that. We'll look back at the good times and say the way that it used to be. It may have been good. And the bless His name, we've got to live on fresh bread today. And we've got to be fed today. I can't live on yesterday's blessing all the time or how bad it used to be. And I'm thankful for the revival meetings that I've been blessed to be a part of. And those sat meetings that I've been blessed to be in. And when it seems the Spirit's overflowing and begins to overpower us and we can't even begin to describe the feeling that we have on the inside. But we need to understand that if we never feel the strongness of that Spirit in a physical meeting, in a physical sense again, while we're alive here on this earth, that we still have got to keep laboring. We still have got to keep pressing forward because the enemy is going to try his best Amen. to overcome us and to bring doubts in our minds spiritually. That's what he was doing to these people. He was oppressing them. He began to come to the poor and needy and the Israelite nation was very mean to them. He came to them and he would even cheat them. Out of there, he speaks of the time in chapter 8 and that they would take the balances and that they were weighing their shekels with and the wheat that they would begin to bring in to get money and they would weight those balances. Yeah. They were cheating the people. Yeah. 
they can be a little off, and then they'll put their stuff on there, and it don't, it don't amount to as much as it would have if that weight wasn't in there. Wow. He condemned them for that. Yep. But they needed to be honest. We need to be honest today as well. Yeah. So that we might be peaceable in the sight of God that we ought to be as we're living here. Oh, Amos came to them boldly. He let them know, you need to repent. You need to change your way. Because God has looked down upon you. And as you look through here, He started speaking to them in chapter 3. And He said, Hey, the lion is about to roar against you. Now, you Bible readers, you probably already know who the lion is that's going to roar against them. Now, we read about him in the book of Revelation and over in the New Testament Scripture. And that when he begins to roar and the voice of God begins to sound out, and that we must take notice. And when God speaks, we will take notice. Now, we will be condemned. Now, we may say no we won't yes we will and he's promised us as I said a while ago that he'd speak at least once that to us when we're unsaved to begin to draw us I'm thankful he does it more than once with some but us that are in the church he's blessed us with that conscience that when the man of God begins to stand and preach the word and that's why he said reprove rebuke exhort with all long suffering Bring in doctrine, and because that axe that he spoke of there, it's able to cut going, and it's able to cut coming. It'll begin to cut us down, get down on the inside of an individual when we're unsaved, and when we're a child of God. Yeah. It'll convict us of what we're supposed to do. And if we don't do what we're supposed to do, we'll never have the joy that we could experience as a child of God as we live here on this earth. As he began to speak there in chapter 3, the lion of the tribe of Judah began to speak up. He said to them, Can not two walk together except they agree? Those two nations had been split. He knew that there had been a division take place. Many prophecies about those two that had been divided. And then when he spoke, and I don't want to get into this, it strays away from the complete message of Amos. But Ezekiel talked about a time that there'd be two sticks, one with the name of Judah, one with the name of Israel. And that he's told the prophet, put it in your hand, and they'll become one stick. I'm glad today that we're in one church here upon the Lord, as blessed in this life. A one faith, one Lord, one baptism. He's coming back for it, the true Israel of God. And those that have been added unto the church have become a Jew inwardly. And that he's coming back for us one day after a while. Amen. Let's listen to that line as it roars. It'll start shaking that you heard me preach on the, the line and the roar and the, the, the loudness and the lowness of those decibels when that line over there would roar. And that the speakers that we have here when those bass notes hit those speakers to dust. We'll start shaking off those speakers right there. When those lines would roar over there, the dust on the ground would come up from the vibrations of that voice from that line. When the line of the tribe of Judah begins to speak, though our soul may be as dead man's bones down on the inside, dry and needy, bless God when He speaks with that loud voice, it may condemn us. It may encourage us. It may rebuke. It may exhort. I'm thankful for whatever it means in my life. When it speaks to me, He knows exactly what I need. Amen. He'll give us that as we move forward. Yeah. Why has He done this? The lion has roared. He said, He's spoken judgment unto you folks in Judah and Israel that you need to repent and change your life. You've been doing people wrong. You strayed away from the law of God. You're not living where that you need to be living. Uh, you begin to come and you've offered up uh, sacrifices and praise. You come and worship me. Uh, but he said, hey, you're just going through the motions. Your heart's not in it. Uh, don't we see that today? Uh, uh, people come Sunday after Sunday and uh, they'll go through the motions. Uh, uh, they all know when the stand up when to sit down, when to move around and shake hands. They know the routine that we go through here in our church service, but they're dead on the inside. There's no life 
in their heart and they need to be shaken by the voice and the word of God and that's the only thing that can bring life to a dead soul and that's the only thing that can begin to shake us up when we're cold is the fire of God as old Jeremiah said it's a fire in my bones I couldn't keep my mouth shut when he began to warm me up down on the inside God loves us. He's once he's fixed a perfect plan. Amen. We'll just follow after him. And as he spoke to these people here, he began to refer to a remnant. That last verse I read there, a remnant of people. Yeah. He saved a remnant that would be able to preserve the lineage of this uh, church that we're a part of today that would bring Christ up to where that he was. <coughs> he worked with that remnant all along. And you know what? There's going to be a remnant here on this earth when God returns. Yeah. He promises. Ask, would there be faith here? Yes. There'll be faith here when I return. Yeah. How do you know that? Because I read what Paul says about a resurrection that's going to take place. And he said that there's going to be some standing here when that resurrection takes place. And they'll be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Right. And caught up together with them Praise that are in the air. So as he moved on through here. Oh, I need to move on. He encouraged them over and over to seek the Lord. Church today, seek Him. You may say, I know where He's at. He's up here on His throne. I'm not talking about asking you where He is. I'm talking about getting closer in a relationship with Him. You can never understand the deepness of God. And you will be able all your life if you will seek after Him. And not just say where He is on the throne or what He done for you. But begin to know Him more and more and more as you grow as a Christian so that you will be better equipped to face the enemies that's out there. Yeah. so that we will be able to have that relationship and communion with God that we're supposed to have Amen. but you're not going to get it when everything else is more important to you than coming out to a church service yeah. you will not get closer to him yeah we all do what you said pray and read that's good but it's not everything that you need to do to get closer to him got to gather out with God's people. Yeah. He told us we needed that. Yeah. Now he said, he told them as he winding down here, I know I'm just hitting high places and what's going on. He said, I'm going to bring sorrow upon you. He brought a time in chapter four when he brought depravity to them when they wasn't able to have any meat. They dried up their fields. He said their teeth was clean. What's that mean? That's some more Bible language. You read in Revelation about teeth uh, quite a bit. What's it mean if their teeth's clean? If your teeth's clean, you ain't been eating anything. Uh, they're clean. They're not nothing on them. Uh, he said your teeth are going to be clean uh, because I'm going to take away your food. Uh, I'm going to take away everything in your fields. Uh, why? Because you've been disobedient. Yep, yep. Your teeth's going to yep. be clean. Thank God today, sometimes he'll withdraw from us so that we'll start seeking after him a little more. Yeah. If you're a Christian, you've felt those cold times in your life. And he, when he begins to withdraw, you know why he does that? So that we're not all the time just living for what we feel. If it was ever Sunday we gathered out here, it was shouting. And now, I'm not saying that if we live the way we ought to, we can have that. But when we begin to expect gathering out here and seeing a mighty movement of the Holy Spirit that moves throughout our service and our congregation and that's the only reason we're coming we're coming for the wrong reason you mean we're coming if we're just expecting the Lord to move we're coming for a wrong reason yes we're not coming to get something we're coming to give something Amen. Amen. when we do give him our whole mind our heart our strength then he'll start moving in our lives the way that he should Thank God for that. And then he tells them as he goes, I'm going to bring calamity upon you in chapter 4. You're going to have depravity. You are, you're not satisfied with what I've given you. You've gone the wrong way. Verse 12, he said, Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. I'm about to pour judgment, more judgment upon you. What did he say as you move on? About those, those verses there that I started reading to you. That's when... He said, prepare to meet your Lord. Start seeking after Him. Those verses in chapter 5 that I read to you, He started warning them time and time again, seek 
after the Lord. Then he comes down and how that they're just vainly going through the motions of doing what that they're supposed to do. And then he tells them through his vision that he begins to have a woe unto them. In chapter 6 he said, a woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. Hey, you know, if we're comfortable in our lifestyle, how we shouldn't be. How you may say, well, I think we should be comfortable when we serve God. And it's good to come out and feel comfortable here in this service. And that we've come out that we're freely able to worship God. And that's not what I'm talking about, Lord, it's what God was meaning. And that we are at ease in Zion. And when we're at ease, and we've quit working. And we're not laboring. And when we've quit moving forward. And we're just sitting idle in our Christian walk. How woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. Yeah. So if we're just sitting there idle, when you're idle, you're not real careful. You maybe think you're idle, but you're going in the wrong direction yeah. while you're just sitting there. Well, why do you say if you're just idle and you're going the wrong direction? Because what God wants us to do, instead of just sitting still, we need to be moving forward. Yeah. Rather, what we're doing is we're sitting there and we're missing out on what we could have been doing when we were going that direction. Right. So we need to trust God. He can help us. God, How are we going to do that? Again, coming out to do what he's told us to do. Chapter 8, he began to tell them in the end of chapter 7, I'm going to set a measure and stick out to you. I'm going to put a plumb line. You builders, Bert Sanford knows what a plumb line is. If you don't have a level and a plumb line, your building's not going to be very square. It's not going to be level. And you're not going to have a good, sturdy, solid building. And when we're measured up to the plumb line of God, and we're not standing where that we ought to be, rather than moving forward and we're moving backward, that plumb line will tell on you every time. Now, if I took a block out of the corner of this building back here and that went down just a little bit, that plumb line will tell on you. That level will tell on you. If we take one out of the front or add one to the front and this ends a little higher than that end, that plumb line will tell on you every time. You can't get by with not doing what God's told you to do. The plumb line's been set and if you're just sitting idle when everybody else is moving forward in the church, you're not where you ought to be. And that plumb line's going to tell on you every time. It'll show you where you've come up short. It'll show you where you've not been doing what you should be doing. He said after that, he said that plumb line set. He said, you're right in chapter 8. He said, I'll show you a vision of a summer basket of fruit. Oh, we're thankful when we're right. When we're bringing out fruit, the Bible teaches us about fruit in our Christian walk, doesn't it? To add to your faith all these things. And he says the fruits of the Spirit, all these things that he lists us, brethren, preach on over and over. That if we've got the fruits of the Spirit rather than the works of the flesh, we're doing real good. And so we need that fruit of the Spirit in our life. And but if we begin to have that fruit, he said that basket of summer fruit. I said, Israel, you've got it there. But it's right. I know you all are smart enough to understand this this morning. If you take a bag of apples or a box of bananas and you set it out and it's good and ripe for ready to eat, what's going to happen in a day or two? If you don't begin to eat all of it or put it away or preserve it in some way, what's going to happen? It's going to start rotting. So when he looked at Israel and when he looks at me and you, when we're just sitting idle and we're straying away from that plumb line, you know what's happening? Our fruit is rotten in God's sight. Uh, Brother Tommy Dameron preached here Friday night uh, about the savor of the Lord that goes up into God's nostrils. Uh, and when we're doing good uh, and we're laboring like we ought to, uh, that's a sweet smelling savor. Uh, when he smells the blood of his son uh, on our sins and we're walking in the righteousness of God, uh, he loves that uh, and it smells good to him. Uh, but if we're sitting idle or we're straying back or we're not doing what we should and that fruit, that right fruit that's before God in our life it's become a stench in his nostrils and he doesn't like that just like he told him I would but you'd be hot or cold if you're lukewarm I'm going to spit you out if our fruit is rotten and it's got rotten and then it rots you know what it's just going to be thrown away yeah. He does not want us to come stagnant in our Christian walk. 
Amen. He goes on through this book. I'm about to come to a close here. It's nine o'clock on that clock back there, so I'm in good shape still. <laughs> he says in chapter 8, Behold, verse 11, Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Oh, my goodness, today. I don't want to see our people. God. I know this is a prophecy that's taken place that God stopped the mouth of the prophets for several hundred years after this. Yeah. And there wasn't a prophet heard until John the Baptist stepped on the scene there in the New Testament. There was a silence that was made. People will argue and say, well, it says, but it's, it's not a silence of the word going out, but of people hearing it. That, that'll preach to a certain extent that people just won't hear the gospel. We're living in that time today, too. But if you'll read that next verse, it says, And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the earth north to south, and in the east, and shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. So those people that say there in verse 11 that it's just a famine for just hearing the word, that the word's being spoken, and they're not able to hear it because they've got that deafness in their life, they've been blinded. That verse right there, they need to just go on and read the next verse and put it in its proper place because it tells us in verse 12, they're looking for the word and they can't find it. Why was that? Because God had turned his back against those people. That's why Jesus said and he stood and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered you together as a hen doth gather her brood, but you would not. You stoned the prophets that I've sent to you to warn you of your sins and get us points you in the right direction and just stone them and kill them. So he said, your house is left unto you desolate. Dead. No life in it. That's when he began to turn to you and I today. And that's what the ninth chapter begins to speak about. A time that he was going to bring in the Gentile people. And he was going to allow us to come. And he said in chapter 9, verse 12, they that possess the remnant of Edom, that's Gentile people, and all the heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord, he doeth this. But he's going to let us know that I'll restore Israel. And I'm thankful when he did restore it. Praise God, he added me to it. Amen. That I'm a Jew and orderly now. I'm a part of his family. He's coming back for one thing. And that's his church. Yeah. So let's get in it. And I've just hit the very high places here in this book. Go home and read the warnings that he gave those people time and time again. Begin to look at our own life and see we need to move closer to him. We may be just sitting out. We may have good fruit, but are we adding to that fruit continually? Because if we just live on some fruit now, that fruit's going to get rotten and there'll be a stench in his nostrils and he doesn't like that. So let's stay fresh. The bread that they put out on the table of showbread is stayed fresh all the time. If he wants that bread that he provides us that's fresh. He wants us to get him some freshness in our life every day. That's going back to that prayer I was talking about. Don't just go through the same repetitious prayer that you prayed. He can do that in the scriptures. Don't just go to your, your Bible and just read to be reading. Don't just go to church just to be going to church because you feel guilty. But if you didn't, go because you love God. Go because you want to grow closer to the Lord. If you're not a Christian today, you can be. He loves you so much that he died for you. These same woes that he's pronounced upon these folks here, it's going to be so much worse on the day of judgment if you don't come in God's way. And when he calls you, step out on faith. Amen. Let's come to a song. Singers, come. We'll get a song. I took too much time here this morning. I'm thankful for what God's done for us.
church, move as you feel led.
help them out with their gas next weekend when they come to be with us. Move around, fellowship. We'll sing this last song to you. Don't you feel that? The invitation still stands as well. <laughs> Friday night, I guess the sisters Thursday. Yep, yeah, six o'clock. Six o'clock Thursday, ornament exchange with sisters. We're gonna do practice with the kids at four. Four? 
4 o'clock today, kids will be practicing their Christmas program. If you want to come, if you've never been, you can still come. We've got time to practice a little bit, so bring them out. 4 o'clock today, looking forward to that, too. Um, as I already mentioned, next Sunday is our Christmas dinner, and those brethren will be here to preach, and uh, Gospel Heritage to sing. Saturday night is our business meeting here, so keep that in mind. And I don't know if it'll work out this month or not, but I think we're going to get a new sister here by letter soon. And it may be next month before we get her here. But Sister Pam is going to be bringing her membership here to Salem, and we're thankful of that. But it's got to go through Paul's Chapel before it gets here. So I think their business meeting is on the second weekend, too. So let's be praying about that. Anything else? All right. Hearts and minds free. So, we'll bow our heads, be dismissed. We'll ask Brother Sanford if he will pray his mission. Dear God, once again, Father, that you bless us to come to the close of another little service, Lord. We're praying that it met your approval, Lord. Yeah. Dear God, I'm asking you, dear Father, that you would continue with us, Lord, that you would help us to draw closer and closer to you, Lord, to learn more and more, dear God, as we travel through this uneven walk of life. Dear God, that you may get glory out of us. Dear God, I ask you that you would go with us, that you would watch over us and leave your at purpose. In the name of Christ Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God. Happy birthday.